When I started to ponder on the topic for this podcast, I began by questioning my own journey into the self. There are numerous life-changing lessons that I've acquired, but at the very base, at the very helm of it, is the need to be aware and the need to be mindful. I um, had an outline before I started to speak with Adam, but as he unfolded his story and his experiences, I found that that every story and every answer to a question resonated with the theme of mindfulness. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation and take from it as much as I did. So, without further ado, I present to you Adam Carmichael, the mindset coach all the way from Bali. Hello everyone, welcome to the first episode with a host for the Mindfulness Series. Today we have our guest Adam Carmichael. Adam is a mindset coach and today we're going to talk about the need for mindfulness in life and in poker. So without further ado, let me introduce our guest. Adam, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'll do. I'll try to do a quick version but also do the key details. So basically I graduated from university in England, a university called Leeds. I did sports science and I was very into sports and performance at the time. And after I graduated from university, I realized that jobs were very competitive and hard to get into. And I was kind of struggling, in all honesty, for about 18 months to find anything that resonated with me. I ended up living in my parents' house, just working part-time at retail shops, um, partying a lot, living a kind of social lifestyle, but really was kind of drifting in life and not really having anything to anchor myself to. And then uh, some friends who were living in a different city to me, Give me a phone call out of the blue and it went adam um have you have, have you thought about playing poker before and i was like um no not really and they was they said we found this website called shock score um it's got all the shock score about all the profits of all the online poker players and i was like okay this sounds good but what's this got to do with me and they're like we think we could make money playing poker are you interested in giving it a try and at the time i had nothing going on like i said i was living at parents house no real expenditure apart from a bit, a bit of rent for my parents so I was like all right well whatever you guys got plans I'll give it a try with you guys let's start the very micro stakes and see what we can do so uh, anyway we went away come with a little plan to like see if we could play this game so we started playing ten dollar heads of sitting goes with our hundred dollar roll or whatever we had at the time it was something really really small and we could get a little bit of success but nothing major and we didn't we weren't really committing to it so one of my friends set the brand around me was like adam i think if we're going to do it we need to do it seriously and we need to give it a proper go so he decided that we should move away from england and we decided to move to thailand and this wow. is a real big shock to the system yeah. and the reason for yeah. this was get out of your normal routines and we're just going to live in a villa together we're going to live and breathe poker for three months all right three months i'm going to see what we can do so first of all i was like I'm not sure I can afford this. I'm not sure where I'm going to get the money from, but I've heard Thailand's really cheap if I can get there. So all I need to do is book a one-way flight and I'll figure the rest out when we get there. <laughs> so uh, I decided, I said, yes, I was. I signed up to be in for this um, adventure. And my thoughts were, I was, I was 23 at the time, so I had no, nothing really going on. So I didn't have anything to, uh, yeah, any kind of responsibilities. And my kind of thought was, even though I was very kind of young and not know what was to do my life, my thoughts were, if it works out well, and I start making money for poker, that's amazing. And who knows where that can go. If it didn't work out well, it's a great life experience. I've learned some good lessons and I get to see Thailand for a few months before I come home. So I was like making a win-win and I was young enough to kind of take on a reckless adventure. So I started, anyway, we got on the one with flight. I'll try and make the story a little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. Got to Thailand and we started playing heads up sitting goes from the, the smallest stakes. I think it was like $5 or $10 games and just grind those stakes. We quickly realized that in order to uh, kind of live abroad and to pay the bills, we're going to have to move the stakes a little bit more aggressively and play a little bit higher. So we're playing poker 10 hours a day, like not even exaggerating that. It was 10 hours a day of sitting, playing poker, studying alongside that, and just living and breathe it for three months. The three months passed by in a flash, and we had the option to extend our rental in, in Thailand. And we did, because we're doing okay in poker, and we said, okay, we're going to extend it. Fast forward a few years and I, I was still in Asia and I went from Thailand to Bali and I'm basically progressing from 
the low stakes heads up sit and go formats to the mid stakes and then eventually to, towards the high stakes. So this little random phone call, get into poker, ended up being my pursuit to get better at something. And as soon as I got into poker and I, I spent the first six months in it, I was like, I can see where this can go. And I can see if I work hard at this, the, the sky's the limit in a way. And I really took to the game. So uh, I went from being drifting in life and not knowing where I was going to having an avenue to dedicate myself to and get better at. So long story short, I ended up playing poker for six years. I went from the lowest stakes in my format to the highest stakes in my format and created a great financial situation for myself to the point where I was like, what's next? And poker was this great kind of growth curve for me. And I got to a point where I ticked all my boxes in terms of financially, living where I wanted to, playing the highest games in my format. And I was like, mm, what next? And it was very tempting just to keep playing poker. And a lot of my friends and most of my friends kept playing poker, but there was something inside me that said, Adam, there's another chapter waiting, something else waiting. And for me, I was always interested in the mind and the body, mind and performance. Mm -hmm. So I did sports science at university, if you look at what I've been reading for the last 10, 20 years, it's all about the mind and optimizing behavior. And I was quite good at it. So I was quite good at myself and how to optimize my own life. So I was like, oh, right. I'll start sharing some ideas of how to optimize your life and what I do and see if that resonates. So I started a free Facebook group for a YouTube channel. And then I started like, sharing ideas just like on the side of playing poker. Mm -hmm. Those ideas started to resonate with some people. Some people started to reach out and go, Adam, can you help me with stuff? And then I was like, oh, I mean, it's, it's like maybe there's a, an avenue to go into coaching. And then I, I've always thought about helping people and uh, basically optimizing other people's lives for them, helping them in that process. And one of my school teachers once said, like, I think you're going to be a teacher one, when I was younger. She said, I think you're going to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. I hated school. I hated school. I was like, <laughs> no way I'm going to be a teacher. Like, I, don't know what, I don't know what you're saying to me, but I'm not going to be a teacher. And she was like, yeah, but you like teaching other people. I used to, I used to always help the, the student next to me. I used to always get good grades because I used to always condense stuff and teach the, the kid next to me yeah. but I didn't class that as teaching it was like one-on-one -on -one coaching and they always had a kind of inkling of like sharing knowledge like learning and sharing there's something that resonates with that concept so I ended up just going deep into uh, the mindset performance uh, kind of field and going okay what can I contribute in this avenue wow. at the time people were reaching out to me to work one-on-one -on -one, and yeah next day I know I'm transitioning into coaching and yeah I decided that, that was gonna be a full-time thing and I around 2017 I made a big segue and I went okay I'm not going to play poker. And all those hours I play poker are now going to be on studying the mind and performance. And I'm going to be coaching players to do that. And then that just built from a, a very small idea to four years later, I've, I've worked with at least 200 players now, maybe slightly more. And yeah, I've been helping them improve their mindset and performance to optimize their poker performance. Awesome. What, what a journey, like so much to dig in there. But what I'm going to really pick on and go on to a topic from there is that very young you decided that you could take that chance, right? So to all the young audience who are out there who are on the cusp, whether shall I or shall I not, Adam took three months off and you know he got he gave it a shot. And I think short taking as in poker as in life should definitely be there because so many times we take the safe avenue, so many times, right? You would have been in a blue collar job as well if you followed the normal trajectory. And I'm and I'm sure your parents, we've spoken about how your parents would show you the, the, uh, the newspaper list, okay, Adam, you got a job over here. So guys, if you're listening to this, right, and if you're young, you can spare some time. And this is actually being mindful. This is just an example of being mindful. Uh, it doesn't come to people very early in their life that, oh, wait a second, I'm 21, 22. I can actually give time to something that I like. And if that doesn't work out, I can step out. I can't do that when I'm 40. So um, that's a great uh, introduction. And we can learn so much from your story. And from now, we come to the, our topic, the need for mindfulness. Um, a lot of your actions initially as a youngsters uh, seem very um, instantaneous, right? And spontaneous. But I'm sure there must have been a moment when you were grinding and you were in Southeast Asia and you must have been like, what am I doing? Where's my life going? And it made you self-respect and go inside and probably started your journey for mindfulness. So where do you think you became sentient or a self-aware being or you started delving into things? Uh, at what age? How did it start for you? Yeah, good question. And it's a good observation. I was very impulsive. I'm very dopamine dominant as a kind of neurotransmitter. So I, I seek things. I want more of novelty and I, I desire like a kind of reward and doing novel things for stimulants. So for me, mindfulness was not where I expected to end up. And it kind of happened around 2015. I was moving up from the mid stakes to the high stakes. And I remember trying to play the highest stakes games in my format and getting absolutely destroyed by the players there and losing a lot of money in a short space of time. And I saw my mind just unraveling before my eyes. And I could see that I was trying to play poker at a high level 
And I couldn't because my mind was just really busy. It was really, really busy. I started having all these things, self-doubt and all this kind of anxiety and all these kind of yeah mindset issues that we face as people, but also as poker players. And it really like opened my eyes. It was almost like a, a jolt going off. And I was like, whoa, the, th- the thing that's holding me back right now isn't my technical ability, it's my mind. And that got me really fascinated with how, how to uh, understand the mind. And that led me into uh, a mindfulness practice. So I first started going, okay, well, there's something in my mind that isn't functioning at the level I wanted to. And for me at that time, 2015, the, the meditation, mindfulness, like was just a, a field I didn't care about. But performance, I did care about performance. And I remember listening to a podcast by Tim Ferriss and he interviewed, or he had like a, a quote I said, he was basically uh, interviewing top performers all over the world, whether it was athletes, whether it was musicians, businessmen. And he said, at least 80% of high performers have some form of meditation or mindfulness practice. I don't know why, but by the time that just resonated with me really well, I went 80%. I was like, well, I want to be in that 80% of high performers. Maybe I need to start meditating. So that's when I started to delve into uh, what would meditation look like? So I started to use Headspace, the kind of free app and go into a meditation app, a mindfulness practice. But that was just like the very, very early signs. And I was doing it from a performance avenue. As I started to go into the mind, first of all, I realized, oh my God, what an absolute mess. It's one of those things like when you close your eyes and try to pay attention to your breath, something very simple, you've done no work there. Like, wow, it's so noisy in here. There's so much disturbance. There's so much anxiety and so much- The monkey mind, they call it, right? The monkey mind. Monkey mind, yeah, (laughs) monkey mind. Yeah, very very much so. And it's hard to look at. And for me, myself, I wanted to back away from that and just be busy in my life again. But someone was calling me to go, right, Adam, there's there's a mess here. There's a mess to sort out. And the only way to solve that I was to go into, into it. So yeah, I started to spend a lot more time going internal. I started to read all the literature on mindfulness practices. Again, I was this this time I was more interested in performance. So I was like, how can I perform better for using the mindfulness practice? But as I started to go deeper and deeper, I started to see a, a level of calmness in my days. And I, I there's a moment where I realized there's a, there's a, almost like a, a phrase that goes around in meditation where you are not your thoughts, you are not your mind. And that sounds nice, but if you haven't actually experienced that, it can almost just seem like empty words. But I got to the point where I was observing myself and I, I almost like watched myself from an observing point of view. And I watched the mind operating. I watched the thoughts like just popping up. This is a, a big break for a moment. It took me probably six months to get to there. And I was going, ah, that's the thoughts. And this is me observing. And I got very curious about, I am the observer of these thoughts. And even if in that, that sense, like it's basically what's doing is creating space between your consciousness and your thoughts. And in that space is everything. That space is the, 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 t- the chance to not yeah. act on impulse. It's the chance to choose what choice you want. And I realized the more, more depth I went into the mind with meditation practices, the more space I created, which allowed me to take better actions in my life. And I could see it in an argument. I could see someone say something that would annoy me. And normally I would impulsively mm-hmm. react. And I, could, I was still. And I would go, oh, I can choose to react. I can choose not to react. Mm-hmm. I can see a pot escalate on the pot tables. I can see my frustration build in my body. Normally I'd impulsively act on it. I can see it and choose which action to take. And that become this like superpower that I was like, ah, oh, this is really, really interesting. And it's so useful for mm-hmm. every area of your life. And as soon as that connection was made for me between poker, meditation, life, performance, it became the whole one big game. That's when my kind of mind really, really got into it. And that's when I, the last... Two years in particular, I went super, super deep in the mind. I spent a lot of my days going into deep meditation practices and going deep into my mind and also understanding I'm a bit of an intellectual guy. So I need to understand like the mechanisms of how the mind works. What are the kind of cause effect relationships? Why is the mind not a simple thing? What is what's causing the issues? And yeah, I realized myself, the more I went into the mind, the better I did at everything. Whether I'm trying to play tennis, I'm better at tennis. Whether I'm trying to be in a relationship with my partner, I'm better in that relationship. Whether I'm trying to be a poker player, I'm better by being more mindful. I'm better at everything. As soon as I did that, as soon as that was a connection made, the motivation to keep going there become easier and easier. So I, yeah. Adam, I'm glad you shared that because I had a similar start and I started with Headspace. So I know exactly the points that you're talking about, um, about mindfulness. And I was very skeptical about an app, right? Like how can an app guide me into meditation? It's something so personal. You need a guru, you need someone. But when you don't have a choice, and I had a younger brother who put me onto it. He's like, you should try this. And I did. And I was hooked in a very good way. And everything that you said of being aware and of zooming out and looking at things, it relates so much clearly. And there's so many techniques, like one of which was you start with focusing on your body and then 10 minutes, uh, 10 minutes off on your breath. And then it says, think of whatever you want to. And the dots disconnect, right? I can do this. I can do that. Hey, why didn't I think of do this? Hey, I got a business idea. Why didn't I try this? 
And it, it was amazing. It was as if, um, you, you know, you're literally in the matrix and you can see it, or at least a part of it. So uh, I'm, I'm really uh, like, it's actually good to actually talk to someone about that and that, you know, we're on the right path in terms of uh, getting self-aware. Again, a, a good metaphor somebody used for this is like, it's like going to the gym, right? Yeah, you got to go there every day. You got to work that mind muscle. It's not like just a day or a year. It's a lifetime thing. It's a constant process. And there are going to be ups and downs. Uh, there are times of clarity, uh, but you do have, I mean, your anger becomes less. And then I realized that, okay, I just need to be constant at it. And I zoom back, take some perspective. So for example, I moved up in stakes recently and I lost a certain amount and it got to me. It was like, wow, okay. That just got to me. And then I was like, wait a second, that's just three buy-ins down. What are you, what, what are you thinking? I was like, hey, that's perspective, right? So just move on. Okay, we get back to the grind. So, I mean, I, I see that journey, how it has been for you. And uh, 2017, you started your mind journey. Um, who was your first? Because I understand when you do it yourself, but when you are wanting to teach others, it comes with a responsibility and you want to uh, be sure that what you're doing is in a structured way. So how was it with your first student and um, in that subject when you started mindset coaching? Yeah, good question. And it was... Basically, I was putting YouTube content out probably, probably a few months before I started coaching. And I was doing, at a Facebook group, where I was just posting daily, daily ideas, daily experiences. And for me, like when I was going into coaching, I had no clue how I was going to approach it, no like set structure. All I knew is I had the idea that I wanted to help people and I had ideas that I thought could be useful. So when I went into coaching, my first thing was, can I help people? That's the kind of the question I'm asking myself. And then when people would resonate with my content and reach out for me, my first goal was like, in what ways can I be of help for you? All right. So uh, myself, I am a bit of a problem solver. I'm good at solving problems. That's generally why I went into poker. So I'm just trying to come up with a solution to the individual problems. So uh, first of all, like I was doing it from experience. So I didn't teach anything that I hadn't already lived and breathed. So uh, I wasn't trying to just read a book and go, okay, I've learned this idea. Now you can do it. I was going to care. These things have worked for me, these practices. And um, these approaches have worked really well in this environment. And I also knew the poker landscape very, very well. I spent six years in it. I, I, most of my friends were big poker players at that point. I knew the problems. And I spent ways and a lot of time thinking about how to overcome these problems. So when I started working on mindset, I had a lot of experience, but I also had like, like your yeah, hands-on um, yeah, knowledge of like the problems players were facing. So players would come to me with the problems and then we talk them through them together. So uh, my coaching style evolved a lot over the first few years in particular. Uh, yeah, the main thing was like the kind of empathy for their situation, wanting to help, and then basically having a good understanding of the mind and yeah, basically how to uh, help people move forward. Now, when I first got into coaching, I didn't know anyone here as much as I know now about how to change behaviors, how to change people's um, kind of operating systems, but I still had the, the enthusiasm to want to uh, tell people. And that's, I think when you've got that and you're really, you're on a call with somebody, you're trying to help them solve their problems with them and they can tell that you're, you're rooting for them, you're, you're trying to you fix their problems with them. It becomes this really authentic relationship where you're, you're both working towards a common goal. So yeah, it's quite scary when you get into anything new, whether it's getting into poker, whether it's getting into mindful coaching, you don't know until you, you get in there. Like, there's an element mm -hmm. of you can plan all day long, you can know, all the systems and structures and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But then there's an element of in the moment, things just happen, things unfold and just being there. And I think as a coach, one of the things I've learned to do more is be more in the moment, be more present, be a bit more less planning and more listening to what are your unique problems? What am I getting from your tone of voice and the way you're displaying that that's causing an issue here? What's the underlying uh, kind of cause beyond your words that, uh, that I can get to? And the more still I am, the more I'm trying to be present in the coaching directions, often the more deep I can go in terms of helping them fix their problems at a higher level. Okay, excellent. And what? Uh, let's take it from the top. Our first episode for this podcast was about goal setting, right? Once you decide, okay, I play poker or I do a certain business or I do anything else, you've got to set goals, right? Milestones and plans so that you don't have to, like you said, plan every day. You set your goals and then you just get back to, then you get down to the action steps and the process. So um, what are the mindfulness aspects that one should keep in mind while setting goals and targets for their future? whether it's poker or life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think when it comes to goals, you need to have two things in mind. One is like the long-term, where you're trying to get to, all right? And I think you've covered it in your video on goals, yeah. about being mindful of your why, why you do things, where you're trying to get to. What's the long-term picture? All right, so the way I see goals often, they're more, more short-term. It's an objective. It's something measurable. It's achievable. It's very directed and the reason we do that is because we want to uh, direct our attention our energy our focus in a, a certain direction if not we drift all right it's like 
going to cart and going, okay, I'm going to go somewhere. If you, if you want to set your start, start navigation and put in a destination, you can't optimize. You can't optimize your route because you're just going somewhere. It's going to go into on a drive, you're going on a random trip. So we always need to navigate towards an outcome. All right. So it's good to sit down, pick goals and have it really clear. Now, I think it's more the goals themselves a more direction than anything else, all right? So back in the day, I used to set very rigid goals. By that, I mean, do this, this amount of hours, this amount of time, this amount on this. And I think at certain times in your life that can work well, especially when you're not used to, uh, you've come from quite a free, spontaneous living, having a bit more structure can work well. But now the way I look at goals is it's like setting a direction. I'm going this direction and checking in with yourself very often. So I think having holding yourself accountable to a standard and checking in. So for example, you might set target for grinding hours, target for um, your studying, you might set target for uh, your warm routines or being mindful around your grinds. You might set some lifestyle goals about what foods you're gonna eat, how much exercise you're gonna do, just a rough way of how you're showing up in the world. And then you wanna, at the end of a week, like check in with yourself, how am I showing up? How am I showing up to the standard? And then if you're not showing up to that standard, just course correct. And it's not like a rigid thing where you beat yourself up and you go, oh, I'm, I'm an idiot, I should do more. I think a lot of people, get into guilt very quickly and they feel bad for not hitting the standards and then very quickly they stop setting goals and stop setting targets. And I think it's basically setting a standard so you know what to aim for and then course correcting as you go up. So in terms of what to include in that, like goals are so specific. Like it's very person dependent. I can't even tell you a mindfulness goal because I don't know what you're, what you're trying to optimize for. So in terms of setting anything specific, it's down to you to think about that. And very often we don't spend time creating individual goals. We have society's goals, make money, get better, get a bigger house, get the bigger stuff, like society's goals. And we've got to get very still to go, what do I want? What do I really yeah. want? All right, what makes me happy? What makes me fulfilled? And that takes a bit more time. And yeah, it's just that self-awareness and mindfulness is the ultimate practice. You know yourself by going internal and realizing what you want. And what you'll find is a lot of things you think you want, they're just like a short-term desire, a short-term desire, like make money, achieve things, get recognition from family, friends. And when you actually get those things, they're quite fleeting, all right? They're quite fleeting. And by that, I mean, they don't create an internal happiness that lasts a long time. And once you get right. past those things, you start to realize, well, if it's not those things, what do I really want? What really makes me happy? And that takes them a lot more time to get to. If myself, it's never external things. The external things literally don't bring me happiness at all in terms of uh, maybe short-term moments, like five minutes of uh, celebrating, mm -hmm. achieving a, a natural milestone, but it's more the pursuit of things. And it's the day-to-day -day working towards things. So uh, goals become the direction and it's the day-to-day -day working towards meaningful things that becomes more, more powerful. Right. I, I think that naturally leads us to our like next subtopic, so as to say, is the process. Uh, I personally have tried to imbibe this mantra in me that process is king, right? You try, and it, it's a little ironic because you play a, a poker for many reasons, one of them being financial freedom and you want a good score. But the paradox is that you have to try and not be result oriented. That I, I find that a, a big paradox. It seemed like very good to read. It made sense. But when you, when, when you go down a downswing, you're like, screw this shit, you know, like what's happening? And to come back to the process is, is very difficult. So um, as a poker player, uh, what kind of a process should one be mindful of? And my particular question is, how does one truly isolate themselves from the result and focus on the process in spite of the ups and downs? Perfect. Yeah, you've touched on some good, good stuff there. One of them was, how do we pursue uh, like the money, the success in poker? without being attached to it, because let's be realistic, most players, if not all players, get into poker for kind of the financial rewards that are available, or to achieve something in the game, get a high score, beat the competition, all this, this is very competitive, all right? If, if you're not in for the money and the kind of achievements, you're just a very competitive person. I've got some, some guys I work with who are just competitive to the core. You could direct them at any game, they'd, they'd just be very competitive at it. So we've got to understand, we've got to bear in mind the reason you went into poker was for those things. Now, the key is you've got to separate how you feel about yourself and your identity and your attachment to those things. Now, this is very difficult because you're playing the game to try and get better, to try and make money. And we're then trying to say, well, I don't want to get attached to those things. So attachment to me means that my identity, how I feel about myself is dependent on those things. All right. So as soon as how you feel about yourself is dependent on your results, winning, or losing, or generally winning is going to be the, the upwards, losing is going to be the downwards your emotional state is all over the place, all right? Now, when you start playing poker, myself included, I had no experience with winning money, 
losing money on a daily basis, high amounts. So my emotional state got dragged around. And for me, it felt like the biggest thing in the world. If I lost three, four buy-ins, I'm like, shit, that's three, four buy-ins. And it wasn't until I like, like started doing my mindfulness practice, but I started to realize what is money? What am I trying to do? And one of the biggest things you can do, well, there's a few big things you can do with like kind of removing yourself from a uh, results orientation. The first is to set longer term perspectives. All right. So results very often in the short term, completely up and down, whether you're the best in the world, the worst in the world, like the up and down, really, yeah. really volatile. So if you get attached to the short term, you're checking your graph on a daily basis, for example, you're going to see all the spikes. On the flip side, if you're seeing a more zoomed out lens and you're seeing a longer term and you're realizing, wait, I'm committed to this poker journey for the next mm-hmm. at least two years, and I'm really going to work hard at it. You can st- stop even looking at the short-term patterns because they don't mean anything. Now, as poker players, we're trying to get validation. Am I playing well? Am I doing good? The problem is we look in the wrong place. We look at our short-term results, daily results, weekly results. Am I winning? Am I doing good? To validate ourselves, am I playing good? Am I a good player? Can I beat this game? In real- reality, that's the wrong metric. We should look at a longer sample size, months and years, or bigger data samples to actually give us that validation. Am I a good player? Am I beating the games? Look at the biggest sample possible. So one thing like you touched on before is training your perspective and remind yourself to see a longer term, longer term view. All right. The second thing is get very engaged in the getting better process. All right. So uh, a lot of people treat life as a game of pass fail, pass fail. Oh, I'm do- if I'm doing good, I'm winning. If I'm doing bad, I'm failing. In reality, it's just this constant getting better. If you treat life as a, a growing learning curve, every day it doesn't matter if you win or lose in terms of money metrics. It's an opportunity to get better. So uh, one of the biggest things I work with players with is how can you see the positive perspective, even in a downswing, not when you come out of a downswing, not when the downswing's over and you can look back and go, Oh, I got so much better from this downswing in the moment of a downswing. How can we learn to see the positive by the positive? I mean, how can I learn from this? How can I get better? What's the life lesson I'm getting here? How can I make this a bigger game than poker? How can I remove myself from that? So I think having that kind of perspective is really important as well. And the next thing is seeing through like, money as a, as a concept okay so if you feel like for example like my highest stress in poker was when i was in a really tough financial situation and i needed to make money to pay the bills all right so there comes a point where yeah. if you deem money is very important and your life circumstances very very much rely on money on, on poker to make that money there's gonna be a high element of stress on that because the importance is high so you want to create a buffer very quickly you want to create good saving strategies you want to get above your spending costs very quickly for me it took about 18 months, maybe two years before I was comfortable with my living costs relative to poker swings. And that's when I was like, ah, I can take the swings in my bankroll and I'm not at a risk of actually having to stop playing the game or going back to get a job and create a buffer. And for me, that required living very cheaply, like almost spending no money for like eight months of almost spending nothing apart from very minimal living costs. It obviously involves making more money, having good um, grind routines, but also you can understand like how to save and invest and actually start to build a bankroll. As a uh, normal citizen in the world, everything's kind of done for you. You get a job, it's paid towards a pension, you pay your taxes, everything's kind of yeah. ticking along nicely on your behalf. As a poker player, none of that. And if things go wrong, there's no fallbacks. So you've got to almost be doubly educated on how to build a bankroll, how to manage yourself financially. And some people have very, very low risk tolerances. By that, I mean, they need like a year's worth of money or living costs to feel comfortable. Some people, like myself, have a much lower tolerance, sorry, higher tolerance. So I can have like a few months worth of living as a poker player and I feel a lot more comfortable. All right, so it's understanding your tolerance for risk. And if you have a, a lower tolerance for risk and you have a very, like a low bankroll relative to your stakes, there's going to be a lot of ups and downs. You're going to be attached to the, the money swings. So just work towards creating that. It takes time. Like I said, myself, it didn't, happened overnight. I went from a very, very broke kid with no financial education whatsoever to playing mid-stakes poker and really, really struggling with the money coming in and out, both my lifestyle and at the poker tables. And it took a while to separate myself from that and become detached. It's all well and good, me saying, don't worry about money, just trust in the process. But if you're in a really tough financial situation, that becomes much, much harder. All right. So I with that, if you are in a tough financial situation, that's when they're looking out, zooming from a bigger lens and thinking, okay, how am I going to do over the next two years? What's the longer term perspective I'm looking for? And then also uh, realizing that even in the worst case scenario, you'll be okay. All right. So uh, I take a lot of mm. uh, advice from the Stoics, the Greek Stoics who yeah. lived thousands of years ago. Yeah. And they Curious. had a concept called, yeah, but curious, yeah, yeah, amazing teachers. And they had a concept called like negative visualization, which was basically they'd visualize the worst case scenario happening and then play it out and go, okay, how would you act? All right, now this is really powerful as a poker player because sometimes we fear going broke, but in reality, or losing money or being in a bad situation, if that situation happens, 
Now, what would you do? And if you did, if you went for an exercise like this, it's really uncomfortable to do. Most people do not like doing this. But if you go for an exercise like that, you realize the worst case scenario wouldn't be the end of me. I'd find a way to recover. I'd find a way to get back on my feet. It would be tough. It would be difficult, but I'd be okay. And as soon as you can realize I'd be okay in the worst case mm -hmm. scenario, yeah. it drops everything. I remember myself when I was really like pushing myself hard to like make money and not go broke. And I was living abroad. And I was like, well, what's the worst case scenario? And I had to sit down for like an hour and visualize and go, okay, worst case scenario, lose all your money. You've got to get your parents to get your flight back home. You've got to move back in with your parents and go back in your bedroom. You have to grind in your bedroom for the next six months to make a bit of money and hopefully get a flight and move somewhere else. Okay, that's not too bad. I can live with that. Okay, cool. is that it? Is there anything else? I oh, know, that's it. That's the worst case scenario. Okay, I'm okay with that. It's, just, it's, like, it's, it's like a weight lifted from your shoulders. You're like, even in the worst case scenario, I'm still in the game. I'm still there. I'm still kicking. I'm still alive. I'm still playing the game of life. And I think those kind of concepts together can be super, super powerful. Wow. Wow. That's so much to take in there. I, I don't even I know where to begin. Uh, I think where I'm going to start from is um, in terms of realizing risk, like you said, having a low tolerance and uh, having a high tolerance, uh, you know, know thyself literally to see where you are, where you can take that. And um, one thing I have to say, which I didn't, so I was someone who was playing poker recreationally and then started playing it more seriously. And, you know, the streams of my income switched more towards one or the other. And then I realized as a recreation player, I had such a luxury, right? I, I didn't have anything on my mind. I could play freely. I, I could make those, uh, you know, uh, check raises more frequently. I, I could put the guy on the pressure because the stakes were fine. The moment I started moving up in stakes and say more of my revenue and money and dependency became more on poker, uh, the mindset sh shifted. You know, you're a different person. You're like, oh, okay, I used to, can I buy in at this tournament right now? So I, I understand where you're coming from because your mindset changes. And I think bankroll management is what you hinted at when you were talking about high tolerance and low tolerance. And that makes a lot of sense, right? So if you have, if you lost three buy-ins and you have a bankroll of 100 buy-ins, that's 3%. You're like, ah, 3%, that's nothing. But the moment you just have 20 buy-ins, that's a, a much higher percentage. And your risk tolerance is obviously going to go up. So uh, definitely a good lesson over there. And in terms of processing, uh, one thing I want to ask Adam is, um, yes, you said that one is look at the long-term perspective, have a stoic uh, mentality towards things. There are certain people, and I'm sure as a responsible mind coach, um, you would advise them not to play. Because what happens is people sometimes pick and choose information from say, you said something very inspirational and very true, but sometimes people say lie to themselves. Sometimes people are not in the right equilibrium or they're not in the right place of mind and they still like go and play poker and they splurge. What would you say to people like that? Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a good, good avenue to cover because as a poker player, you've got to do two things simultaneously. You've got to take the risk and bet on yourself with incomplete information, but you've also got to be self-aware enough to not be delusional and to be punting off money and put yourself in a bad situation. So uh, ideally, you would have some people around you who you can speak with, like poker players who are successful models in your environment to keep you like to a standard. So myself, when I was playing poker, I had two other friends I was living with and we could bounce ideas off with each other. So if I was getting out of sync or I felt like I was just my ego got too big or something they would keep me in check but yeah basically right. you need to uh, realize that okay poker is a very challenging game all right and to beat the games you're gonna have to dedicate yourself to those now the main thing you're gonna judge yourself off is your long-term results all right so if you've got your long-term results at the stake you're playing so if you're ever in doubt if like mm -hmm. how you're doing in poker pick a stake that you think you're able to beat and build a sample size there by sample size i mean like grind those stakes for like a month or so build a good mm -hmm. sample size and show to yourself that the win your win rate's good and static because there's an element of we are taking risks with unknown information we need to not be delusional and play games yeah. and just be losing all right so uh, the main thing is like i'm a profitable player and i can beat the games then it comes down to what state of mind do i need to be in when i'm playing how would my voice need to be what my energy levels what's my emotional state in order to play my best and get my best out of myself so uh, the first box you need to tick is am i beating these games i'm playing if the answer is unsure great right, a, a sample size so you can take that box if it's unknown if it's unknown the way where you're, whether you beat those games and like like you said with that, that example of someone perhaps being delusional or not self-aware enough you've got to like find a way to strip your ego away and build a sample size that you're willing to almost invest, all right? So if you're getting into poker or you're just like, you haven't got a big big kind of, kind of sample size in your career, 
you're literally building a sample size with you don't know you do not know if you can beat the games and that's fine so i'd say uh, play small sessions very focused so you get your best performance and treat it like a, a sample size and gain information when i did this i was playing the ten dollar heads of signal games and my information okay. came back wasn't great it wasn't amazing i didn't have a great mm. uh, i wasn't losing i think it's like just like batting around the break even line but it gave me information i said okay well i'm my current skill level isn't beating the games very well but it's not losing so if i continue to get better i can be in a learning curve and i can very quickly start to beat these games which was what happened so uh, it's understanding like i say you need to track you need to track results um we live in a world especially online poker very easy to use tracking software i use put tracker for my whole career it's very easy to yeah. uh, get the data to basically if you're unsure like look at the data look at the results if you're still unsure reach out to players who are beating the games that you're trying to beat that's always a great one myself i always try to find the guys beating my games online and also beating the games the level above me and i, could, I would reach out to those and try to uh, gain knowledge from them uh, but yeah i think it's it's it's, it's a important consideration and if you're someone who's reckless or you've got, a, you've got a gambling instinct you need to be doubly careful if you're someone who's very much like i'm just gonna go for it like you probably think i'm that guy because i the way i told my story at the start and i was yeah. a little bit but i had enough self-awareness to not let that go into being delusional and just playing the games and yeah. going broke so uh, take on risks only like like you said as well when you're young you can take big risks however mm -hmm. you want to take risks that are calculated and that don't have a ne massive negative. By that, I mean, you don't want to put yourself in a bad financial situation. You don't want to go into loads of debt. You don't want to be in a situation that takes a long time to recover from. Because when you're young, you want to just be able to bounce from failure to failure and go into next things if needed without like a big burden, all right? Either a mental burden or a, a financial burden. So I'd say uh, you've got to balance that kind of risk taking with a level of self-awareness and use all the data and inputs around you to make sure that you're not being delusional on, on that journey. As in most of the world, it's compared to gambling. And, um, you know, our parents, uh, generations before us have been the blue collar, hardworking, you know, you put in the hours, you get success, um, for them to see someone just sitting, clicking a few buttons here and there, and all they know about cards is it's gambling, right? So people feel a lot of resistance. I think even you went through it, um, in terms of how to tell their family and they look for validation at the end of the day, uh, no matter how independent you are, you want to be a good son or a daughter to your parents. Um, it comes with a lot of baggage. So how does one who's serious about poker and decide to take this journey make these decisions? Yeah, yeah. It's a big challenge, right? So uh, myself, getting into poker, my family were very against gambling. My dad had a lot of gambling problems at one stage, which caused oh. a lot of financial problems for the family and very anti-gambling. Like gambling was not to be talked about in my family. Oh, and okay. when I went to Thailand, I lied about it. I said I was going traveling. <laughs> and my mom was like, how you got the, how, where's the money come from to, uh, to go traveling? And I was like, I've been saving on the side. I'm just going. And the reason for me not saying it is because I didn't know what I was going to, if I was good enough to beat the games, like whether well, it's just going to be a very short duration, maybe coming straight back. So I didn't want to say, uh, make all these promises. I'm going to play poker. I'm going to make money. And because I didn't know, I didn't know myself yeah. well enough or the, what was going to happen. So uh, for myself, I just need to build a little bit of confidence that maybe this can work out. And then once I started getting some success, then I started to tell them, I was like, actually, I'm playing poker. And then first, first part of call was you're wasting your education. When you're going to come back home, oh, this yeah. is reckless. You're going to lose <laughs> everything. And I'm like, okay, well, and then instantly I was, I had to defend myself. I was like, well, here's my graphs. Look, this is what I'm making. This is yeah. how it's going. Didn't care. Like, like on empty, it didn't matter what I said or what I, what I showed them. It just felt very reckless to them. And then when I was winning, I was in it, like, say my first few years, I was doing decent for, compared to what I was doing. They were like, stop now, quit while you're ahead, save the money and make sure you don't, um, <laughs> don't lose it. As if I was like in a casino and I was just running good on the blackjack table. Um, so yeah, like it's, it's very hard because like you want your parents to validate you and, and support you. But I think with poker, it's one of those things, especially in your culture as well, it's going to be very, very hard to get that validation. So one of the things I did is I stopped seeking it. I stopped seeking the validation. I stopped asking them to approve of my decisions. And I said I was going to be brave enough to make my own decisions, what I thought was best for my life. Now, my parents, even to this day, as I think I thought we talked about offline, yeah. when I go home, they'll give me a newspaper with jobs that are available <laughs> in the area that are in line with my education, all right? I've been doing this for 10 years now, and still it's like there's, oh, yeah, you're doing that, but... It's not what you should be doing. You're going to come back to the normal world soon and get a real job and do the normal thing. So uh, there's an element, no matter how long you do it, it might not be accepted and that's okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things I stopped doing is I stopped trying to convince my parents that I was making the right choice. All right. Cause I was clashing with them on that. I was trying to show them, yeah. look, 
look what I'm doing. Look, I'm good. I accepted that they had really good intentions for me. They literally just wanted the best for me. They wanted to make sure I was safe. I was okay. I was progressing and doing some meaning for my life. But my choice didn't fit for, with their values and the way they brought up. And it just mm-hmm. was an alien concept to them. So for me to try and overcome that, I decided just, they have their opinions on this. I'm going to have mine. And I over time showed them that I was able to make my own choices through poker and it was working out well. All right. Now, when you're first going into poker, you don't know. Like I said, I, I prefer to keep it secret at first because I didn't want to have the conversations or yeah. how are you making money? How's it going? Because it might have just came crashing down. So I, I say the first thing is don't try to change their opinions on it because they're going to obviously, yeah. um, they're not going to agree with it. But over time, they start to see. So my parents, for example, maybe year three, they're like, oh, you're still doing this. All right. Either you're very lucky or you must know something. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and then I was like, I was like, yeah, there's a skill element. So I was, I was just trying to say, look, there's a skill element to it. I don't expect you to understand it, but I'm dead, I'm I'm trying hard at this. I'm doing I'm doing well. I'm doing well at it, and it's what I, what I enjoy. What I enjoy. It's make, it can bring me happiness. It's bring me freedom in my life, and I I'm enjoying it. And once your parents understand, from my, my own parents, I'm safe. I'm responsible enough to make the choices that are reckless, and I'm supporting myself, and I'm happy. As soon as those things, things were ticked, they're like, okay, we don't know what you're doing, but you seem to be supporting yourself, and you seem to be happy with what you're doing. We're just going to have to let it go. Like I said, I still go home and still get the newspaper cuttings with the job offers, but <laughs> all in all, they accept, they accept what I'm doing. Oh, they have accepted. So I say for yourself, yeah. So I say, oh, I say for yourself, wow. like, yes, yeah, so I'd say for you guys who are struggling with this, yeah. you've got to find a way to somehow make decisions, decisions for yourself without going too far against your parents. Because basically, you don't want to create resistance. You don't want them against you. You don't want to create like a, a conflict in your family. But you've got to be brave enough to go, you know what? I'm going to live my own life and I'm going to make my own decisions. And that's challenging. That's a challenging part. It's going to be an individual kind of process for you guys to come about that. But if you want to pursue poker, there's an element where you've got to be brave enough to go, I'm going to take on poker with all the unknowns that come with it. And I'm also going to realize that society at large, and especially my family, especially my older relatives, will almost certainly never understand this. And they'll probably never accept it and fully if they accept it. They'll never fully be like, oh, Adam plays poker and this is what he does. And this is, they're not going to understand it enough to, uh, to that level. So it's it's going into it with those in mind and being kind of brave enough to uh, to map out your own path and not have the acceptance or support of your family. And like I said, for myself, over time, as I supported myself, they became less kind of questioning, like, when am I going to stop it? And more like, we do, they got to the point where they didn't understand it. But as long as I was happy and pursuing something that I enjoyed, they were on board for it. Wow, uh, that, that's amazing. And, you know, um, like you, Adam, I try and, uh, you know, read a lot more about, say, these about psychology and mindfulness. And um, I came across the, uh, a couple of fa- things which are in line to what you said. Um, one of them was from a book, a podcast. Another one was from a book on stoicism, I believe. Uh, one was that about validation. Uh, was that you do have the option of not seeking it because that's what empowers them. And this was a half-baked concept for me, but what made more sense is that if you're trying to talk to someone and they don't listen, then the prerogative is not on you. It's on them. You might not get approval of your peers, your parents, and to a limit, they don't matter, but whose approval you actually need is the person who's living and breathing with you all the time. And that's your spouse and your partner. Um, you can't in the long term hide it from them and that is something which really stuck to me that I I, so to my partner as well and I'm sure people who are listening to this as well uh, a lot of people they find the path of least resistance right they're like okay I'll just say I went out with my friends I was I was gonna play poker forget that but if you're serious about it and I also have a good relationship with my wife we've been very transparent about it so like we've been together for like dog years you're married for six years you're dating four years before that so we the only thing is how no matter how uncomfortable we say the truth so she knows about me playing she knows about my journey she knows about my struggles so I find it very comfortable and she has now become part of my process so one of the small things that I like to share is like daily after I would grind she would ask me like what's your score and then I realized that um, I was like baby don't ask me what my score was just ask how well did I play And, and that changed you know, that changed that, okay, I need to focus on playing better rather than getting results because swings can get you good results or bad results. So, um, I mean, th- these were a couple of things that actually set me right. And um, uh, coming back to results again, right? Society sees, sees results. And it's unless you ship a big tournament, 
it's very difficult to show what you're doing and results for it and for someone to see oh okay this is something so um because even if you do and they say oh these are cards and it's just gambling you've got to actually take the tough call to know that what you're doing is right is what's making you happy and you know then you move forward um awesome so i'm, I'm glad that uh, people can learn that from you adam that uh, you've got to get some sustenance from yourself you've got to be serious about yourself you got to really dive in and i think a part where people you know resist is that um in india it's normal for people to live with their parents in fact most of the people live with their parents and that is a kind of a respect or a thing that you know youngsters look up to and there's also a fail safe in terms of a backup and things like that as it was for you in your worst case scenario so that is where they see for from something you've been doing lifelong you know respect your elders and everything we don't have a very socratic approach where you can question a lot it's more hierarchical so it's very it's much more difficult whereas in your society it's more lateral right you're taught to ask questions you're taught to be open it's part of your culture that after 18 kids are independent and they live in their own places so it becomes more difficult for people here to take you know uh take their stand and say i don't need your validation so that takes a lot of work but yes that is needed so thank you for that adam poker as a career right if somebody decides to take it i i, I think the most questions i get is that um bro um i'm playing this take i'm doing pretty well i'm in a job should i leave my job and play full time and i take that question as a live dynamite stick because it's someone's life right i'm i'm like oh okay wait first my first reaction is don't do it my first reaction is um you, if you can watch television 4 hours a day you can grind 4 to 6 hours a day right without quitting your job grow a bank roll see if you're serious about it and if it takes and then if you realize if it's conflicting something's that's making you happy or worse something's that's not making you happy and you can financially sustain yourself then by all means give it a shot take a sabbatical and do that but what kind of often approach do you do you suggest to someone in say different stages of their lives as well yeah yeah so like i said it is going to be very different at different stages the younger you are the more risk you can take without very little reward uh, sorry very little downsides mm -hmm. so myself i was 23 i could take a one-way fight to thailand worst case scenario <laughs> I, i'm I jealous out of me I, i'm so jealous i was such a good boy when i was in university in first year yeah. I, I i and in second year i came back and there and i was partying and drinking and doing shots this good you know um indian boy who had all the good grades was doing shots and having fun and they're like is this your clone and i'm and i re I, i resonate with you man i should have crazy your things when i was 22 23 <laughs> yeah yeah that and like for myself like i feel like i didn't take any way near enough risk either even though i did do some like what we cut class risky stuff if i mm -hmm. knew what i know now when you're young and you've got little responsibilities you can literally take so so many risks so uh, if a young person's asking me this question and he's very passionate about poker so he's willing to put time energy into something he's got very little outgoings by that he means he, his lifestyle's not very big he hasn't got a mortgage or anything like that he can go all in with poker and give it a real good go and see how it works out especially if he's doing a job that's just paying the bills he's got no passion for he's just taking along in that situation i'm like okay well go all in with poker see how it goes and if worst case scenario you go back to a job or find another one similar and life goes on on the flip side if you're in your mid 20s or early 30s you've got a family to support you've got a mortgage you've got kids you've got anything of those sorts which have got causing responsibilities you can't do that you can't just do the reckless choice and if anything you've got to be a little bit risk averse and you've got to stop yourself jumping into poker before you're ready because what's going to happen is you, there's a very high risk that you're going to have bad bankroll management you're going to move stakes too quickly you're going to put a lot of pressure on you and your family which going to strain the family relationships and you're going to put yourself in a very bad situation or a, a stressful situation very quickly so um, mm -hmm. in those situations what i would say uh, you want to slowly build your bankroll so i'd say have a bankroll for poker completely separate never gets touched by that i mean you never dip into it all right it's always building and that's just your poker role this is your freedom freedom role i'd call it and what you should be doing is constantly trying to increase your win rate when you're out when you're playing pay attention to what your hourly is every time you play poker like do it on a big sample size and what you want to do is you want to get to the point where your hourly for poker starts to overtake your hourly for working all right at first it might be miles off it might be i barely make anything playing poker but i've got a really stable job which makes this much and you want your poker hourly generally if you've got responsibilities like a mortgage and a family you want your poker hourly to overtake the uh, salary by quite a quite a lot like one and a half times here because the reason is there's variance in your Uh, kind of poker career and yes you might have a higher hourly for poker but you might go full-time for the first month and make zero 
Now what? So you so created. So uh, I say two things: build that poker roll, try to get your hourly for poker above the uh, that for uh, your job, and you want to make sure that you're you're enjoying it, right? I know lots and lots of people who love playing poker part time, but then they play full time and they do not like it. All right. So uh, you've got to think like. Poker is a very fun game to play three or four hours a day. It's a very different mm-hmm. game when that's all you do. It's 10 hours a day. And you've got no income. And if yeah. you don't grind, you get nothing. If you don't, it's very, it's much more demanding. So uh, for some people, it's not a great fit. And for some people, they shouldn't be looking to go full-time. For other people, it's a perfect fit. And being a full-time poker player, they can optimize it and do a lot better. So uh, it's juggling those things. I'd say, like we said, the younger you are, the more you can just go for it and treat like an experiment. Let me, my friends, which... Looking back, it was a great experiment. At the time, it was just a kind of a spontaneous thing. But it was three months. In three months, we found out, can we play poker full-time? Yes or no? Does it resonate with our like personalities? Is it a good fit? Can we see a, a path that can actually progress and we can get better and make a lot of money? Yeah. And if any of those questions came up, no, we could have just went back home, back to our jobs, mm-hmm. and we would have yeah. laughed about it. We would have told stories. I remember that time we went to Thailand. Elliot Rowe calls this the 100,000 bankroll uh, limitation. So what happens is when people reach this bankroll, they don't break orbits and go to the next level. They play it safe. So even if they win a little bit, they come down and there's a resistance where they stay at the 100,000 level. And I, I think a, a lot of it has got to say that, okay, I'm comfortable now and I don't want to take this risk. And you become fearful. Uh, I actually had this issue with myself as well, wherein I realized that I wasn't putting volume, not because I didn't have the time. I'm, I am doing a lot of things. Uh, in terms of like I'm working, I have a business and I'm doing media and I'm doing this, but then I, I I would make this an excuse, right? That, oh, I'm doing so much, that's why I'm not doing this. But then when I delve in and I meditated on this, I realized that, that I was fearful of playing. I was fearful of uh, losing. I was fearful because I've reached a certain bankroll, but I've plateaued, but I don't want to go down, but I don't want to break out. So if someone is in this equilibrium, is in this state of resistance, how does one, uh, what kind of a mindset does change does one bring uh, to, you know, break out of this? Yeah, yeah. So I call this the floor and the ceiling, all right? So uh, we oscillate between a ceiling, which is a high point. So in this case, yeah. 100,000. And then mm-hmm. the floor is the low point. Now the floor is, the, the low point is basically, what's the amount I allow myself to go to before panic kicks in and I'll grind, I'll hustle, I'll do whatever it takes, all right? This can be on monthly income, but also on like, how much money you have in overall and you'll find a lot of people when they hit their floor they're super motivated they're super driven they grind they're in the they do whatever they need to do to make money whether it's in poker or a side hustle and they'll quickly get themselves from the floor up into a comfort zone and they'll keep rising until they hit their ceiling and the ceiling is the kind of their mental limits their limited mindset where they're like okay at this point i'm good and the thing about the ceiling is feels really nice feels really comfortable all the scarcity and all the urgency and all the fear goes away in that moment because it feels good. And then for a lot of people, what they do is they, their mind instantly switches to, uh, instead of wanting to get more, they now, the fear of losing becomes a bigger concern. I don't want to lose what I've got. I don't yeah. want to drop, all right? So you've got to watch your mind do this, all right? So we all do this. We all oscillate between a ceiling and a floor. And the, mm-hmm. all, hopefully the time you want to raise your floor and smash through your ceiling, it, it kind of goes up and up. If you watch your, if you look at your uh, income for the last year, or if you look at it every month, you'll see like you oscillate between a certain boundary and that's kind of yeah. your current ceiling, current ceiling, current floor. It's, it's the same for most people unless you've got a very limitless mindset, you just exponentially rise. And um, yeah, you've got to watch it and go, right, okay, when I get to there, what, what's happening? And very often you'll say, I'm in my comfort zone. So uh, mm-hmm. first thing is to spot the comfort zone and realize it feels nice. It's counterintuitive to go against the comfort zone. But the only way out of the comfort zone is to set a new bigger goal that is worth striving for. It, on the comfort zone, you're on that ceiling. So let's say Elliot Rose example of the 100K kind of um, limit, what you're doing there is you're in limitation mode because you don't want to drop down, all right? Yeah. Now, you need to, in that moment, create a goal, objective, something that's worth striving for, that it's worth going down for, for the potential to go up, all right? And it's, it, it's the way I look at it, you go from a surviving mindset, surviving mindsets, having enough to be comfortable and just yeah. cover living costs and have a decent lifestyle, you've got to go into a thriving mindset. And a thriving mindset is, I want exponential stuff. I want to have full freedom and you've got to go for it. And if you can't create a uh, something to, to strive for, unfortunately, you will get stuck there. You will get stuck there until you can give the mind something that's worth pushing past for, all right? And for some people, they don't get past it. And it's, I'm not there to judge. It's, it's not, not like saying they're, they're wrong for that. They might just go, okay, you know what? I'm happy to have, say, 100K and have a comfortable lifestyle. That's fine yeah. for me. If that's mm-hmm. true and you feel comfortable there, 
accept it, acknowledge it and go, right, I'm happy here. But if yeah. you're feeling like, okay, I'm limiting myself here, I want mm-hmm. to do more, but yeah. I can see myself being risk averse, that's when you've got to change the narrative and realize you're, mm-hmm. you've got a limited belief system for yourself. You've got to create a yeah. new narrative, but also a new aspiration to push past the comfort zone. Yeah. And this is so relevant. And you know what? This kind of a mindset of mine, it came into my investment strategy as well. So I, I had some money which was resting comfortably in my bank account. And the Indian markets, if you don't know, are on an all-time high. It's just like going vertical. And my wife's like, um, why haven't you invested more? And I'm like, oh, it's COVID. You know, things aren't relating. The crash will come. And the crash never came. It's been six months, right? And she's like, listen you're doing this right now. You're going to put this bunch of money in this mutual funds across this thing. You're going to study it, but you're going to do it now. And now it's been there. It's grown 30, 35%. And I'm like, wow, it was like one decision. And my, mm-hmm. so I, I know my tendency it's to be ultra safe. And um, Adam, until like three years ago, I didn't touch cards. Could you believe that? Like I, I was like this really good boy, <laughs> you know, and I uh, didn't do that. But the moment I realized that, okay, the thing about risk is that you've got to face it and you've got to take it to grow because even the money in your pocket is actually degrading due to inflation. So staying static is not an option. So, I mean, uh, that, that's really good advice that you've got to set higher goals and move up the ceiling and move your aspirations. Uh, very tough to do, but yes, absolutely. Adam, what I'd like to ask you about, uh, so our audience can also know, tell us about your course, Winner's Edge, and um, how do you go about it? How long is the course? Uh, and I think the whole idea of why I kept this question towards the end is because I want people to know what you've gone through, what your thinking process is. So that brings them more value to understand you as a person by listening to this conversation. But what is the structure of Winner's Edge? How do you go about it? What did it take for you to take this course out and share it with everyone? Yeah. So for myself, like we touched on, I got into coaching in 2017 and I focused on one-on-one sessions and getting great results one-on-one working with players around the world that started to go really well our players were getting, I was getting great feedback and more people coming in than i could take on so i created a brand called the winner's edge and the winner's edge i wanted to focus on your mindset your <laughs> lifestyle and your health in order to optimize all three things in order to become the best person you could be as you pursue your poker goals so i created a community platform called winner's edge at the moment i'm actually going through a kind of a renewal phase where i haven't been taking on new clients for that uh, kind of coaching platform at the moment but it's all built around group coaching um basically content for you guys to absorb so it's like content all the right modules and then group coaching where we come together as a community and solve problems i'm still coaching in that community but i'm not currently signing on new people i will be okay. launch relaunching um, a new brand very very soon which is very similar concepts and yeah my goal basically is to be able to educate people on the right concepts but also be able to create a coaching environment where people can make changes, all right? So it's not just about knowing the knowledge, right? If I could just give you mm-hmm. information, then just go on YouTube and you, you sort it. Like it's, there's yeah. so much great stuff on there. I all good. You. But you need to know, like, what steps do I need to take now? And also you need to create like kind of a community where other people are on the same journey as you. And that's the key. So uh, when, when I put like together the Winner's Edge community, my goal was I want to get poker players from around the world who mm-hmm. resonate with these same ideas, the same concepts of working on yourself, your mindset, your health, your lifestyle, Wealth pursuing pork at a high level and coming together and create a community of people who are aspiring to the same things and how can we make changes together? And that's, I've been doing that for two years now for that community platform going. I just had a group, group call with my guys two, two days ago and it's amazing. It's amazing to have uh, like-minded people working towards certain goals and we set challenges together, we set goals together, we push each other and we, we solve problems together. I and mean, it's a really personal environment. So uh, yeah, like I said, at the moment, I'm really revamping it. I've got some new ideas which I'm going to incorporate into it. So the moment okay. like it's not open for enrollment, but yeah, because that's okay. the way I do coaching. At the moment I do one-on-one coaching. That's my kind of um, go-to where if you guys want to reach out, you can go to when I said and there's a coaching application. With that, it's basically, I generally work with mid-stakes, the high-stakes players who are already very good poker players and they right. want to aspire to do more. Right. And they either want to play higher stakes, they want to increase their win rates, they want to be better in every area of their life. All right. And for me, I fo- focus on mindset and performance. So I work on any obstacles, any limitations, anything holding them back mindset-wise. And I also optimize everything around their days in terms of how to optimize their performance so they're able to uh, show up at an elite level. All right. And that's very personal coaching where there's an application process. You go for application. If you're a good fit, you have a free consultation with me to uh, talk over your problems, your situation. And then if we both thought that you're a good work to work together, then we'd go into uh, me outlining how I would work with you and how we would be able to solve your problems to get that to the next level. But yeah, that's how I do my coaching. And that's what's been 
my almost my life's mission for the last uh, three, four years, which I've dedicated majority of my, my time to. Wow, it sounds great. And that you've built a community from uh, what you tell me. And uh, you have these group less sessions. Do you, do you do it over Zoom or is it Discord? Yeah. Or how do you do it? Yeah, Zoom? Yeah, we do Zoom. We do Zoom. We've got, okay. we've got a Discord community where we talk to each other, share information, share life experiences, share our wins and challenges and stuff. And then we've got the Zoom for the, the calls themselves and yeah, community platform for that. So for those of you who don't know, Adam also has a YouTube channel, which he briefly mentioned. Uh, it's called Adam Carmichael. Just look it up. Um, Fortunately, don't, there are not many Adam Carmichael's out there, so you'll find him pretty easy. And uh, it was a singer. Good. It was a, a singer called Adam Carmichael, and, and for the first year, I couldn't outsearch him. Every type Adam Carmichael, you got the singer. It was <laughs> the singer. Yeah, I, I found him. I, saw, yeah. I did find him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just, I just got ahead of him in the the SEO so, now. So I, I, all right, that, that's cool. should... So just a heads up, people. It's not the man in the leather pants. It's not that guy. <laughs> it's the buff guy yeah, who crosses arms. That's that's Adam <laughs> Carmichael. <laughs> Excellent. Switched, um, occupation that, that much. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent, Adam. So, uh, Adam, it's been lovely speaking with you, and um, I hope that we catch you on the show again sometime in the future. And uh, oh, one last thing, Adam has been gracious enough to grant one person a half an hour session to have a sit down with Adam. We're gonna run some some kind of, kind of a filtration process as well who that person is going to be and Adam will be in touch. And I think that person will be a whole lot richer speaking with you for half an hour. I know all the audience that have actually tuned into this have been a whole lot richer. Um, more than anything else, it's a self-realization. The purpose of this podcast is actually for people to just dig in, you know, just reflect inside. And it's like, like I know it's very on the nose, but it's teach a man to fish rather than give him the fish himself, right, to eat. So we're not giving you the fish. We're just telling you how to fish. So look into it, start the journey. And one lucky person will be there in touch with Adam. He can talk about uh, whatever he wants to, to become a better person, a better poker player, and sort out things in life. And um, Adam, it's been just amazing speaking with you. And I'm, I'm sure you're someone, um, I have this good feeling about it, that I'm going to be constantly in touch with you as a friend, as someone, as a mentor. It's a, it's a great thing that you're doing, the trajectory that you've taken. And I, I can imagine the struggles that you've had. It's not been easy. As a kid from the UK who left everything to go to something he wasn't sure about, then to double down, to dig in, and now actually being a mind coach, that's phenomenal. And I hope uh, you keep giving as you have to the society at large and you thrive with your craft. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak with Poker Life India for the mindfulness series. It was an absolute ple pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I hope the audience has taken something away from this. It sparked some ideas, give you guys some things to go away with. And yeah, I think for anyone watching this, the main thing is just to uh, go for your dreams, go after what you want and to realize that the game of life is an evolution of just being better, getting better, growing. And what you'll find is as you pursue the external things, I guess to a point where going internal becomes the optimal path to the external. And that's what I found with poker. And that was one of the biggest links I made. I was like, I wanted all these achievements, the money, the success. And I realized going inwards was the way to get there. And it, you, once, you, once you realize going inwards gets you to the external, you also realize all the gold is in, all the gold is internal. So uh, whatever that means to you, if you guys resonate with this kind of content, keep exploring these options. You guys are watching this show for a reason. It shows that this is a path you should be on. Keep exploring it, keep digging, keep exploring yourself and you'll find the gold within. I wish you all a lot of luck and hopefully we'll connect soon, me and Raj as well. We'll hopefully do another part two if you guys get some good feedback on this one. So thanks for listening to the end and we'll speak soon. Thank you, Adam. Have a good one. That was an interesting talk. If you're here and you like the content that we're making and the mindfulness series, why don't you subscribe to our channel and also follow us on our handles of Poker Life India and Poker Bazi on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. For our next episode, we have a very interesting topic, T and T, tilt and self-talk. And for that, we have a very accomplished mindset coach. So more interesting things to come. Tune in again next Monday, same time at 5 p.m. See you then.